Sorry. All right, so this is the rmd file dot number zero one that you can find in the GitHub. Uh, feel free to put in the chat if you're having any issues finding it or pulling it up. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and start right in this document. I don't have any slides prepared, so I'll kind of just be talking through it and we'll be going in and adding uh, code as necessary. Um, but just a little introduction to the topic of re re reproducible reports uh, and why they matter and why they're important. Um, so in my experience, reproducible reports make it easier for collaborators and people outside of your organization or your team to understand and navigate your code if you're sharing it with them. Uh, it makes your code and your outputs more accessible and reader friendly uh, and more e easily digest digestible in terms of your outputs. And you can even make outputs that are really report ready uh, where you could share or publish them um, to a broader audience more easily. Um, it makes your life easier to navigate your code, edit your code, and then update any reports you produce from our Markdown documents. Uh, and then in that way, it can also minimize copy paste er errors, making your life easier again. Um, so here are the packages that Janine listed before. They're up here at the top of the our Markdown document. And so the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and just try to knit this document as is. Um, hopefully it should run if all of your files are in the right place in the same folder. If you downloaded the files from GitHub, it should have come in in a zip file. You can extract that and then open up that R project file, um, which has a extension ending in .proj. P -R -O -J. Um, that's a really helpful tool to kind of keep all of your files organized and accessible and tell R where you're working from. So you can see here, I think my R project file actually has a slightly different name than yours might. Um, but feel free to open that one up as you're getting R Markdown and R Studio started. But the first thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and knit this file. Yes, thank you, Janine. I can also pause if people don't have this file up yet or are confused about the R project file. Happy to explain that a little bit further as well. Um, maybe if I could get some thumbs up if people are ready to keep moving on. <laughs> Thanks, Janine. <laughs> Happy to pause as long as needed, though. Thanks. Okay, seems like a good number of you are ready to keep going. So let's just keep moving along. Um, so I hit knit. We have our knitted output here of the report. So it's titled My Research Project. And just scanning through it, you can see all of the code that we have in our R Markdown file. Um, it's giving us some messages coming from Tidyverse about the packages, uh, more messages, more code. And so the data set that we're using for this workshop is from Pew Research. Um, and we're interested in looking at um, how perceptions about quality of life vary by country for different individuals. And so scanning through, it's kind of hard to find where that is. It's right up here. Um, but things don't really have a clear organization uh, and all of our code is showing. So this is the kind of thing that we'll be able to solve and hopefully create a more easily readable and navigatable report uh, by the end of this workshop. So first things first, uh, when I knit that code, the output popped out in a separate window. And so that's actually a setting that you can change. Uh, I'm here working on a PC. I think it might look just a little bit different on the Mac. Um, but you should be able to find this gear button right next to the knit button that we pressed to get the output. So if we click on that gear, 
you can see that I have a check mark next to preview in window. And so that's just my personal preference that it appears out in that window. If I change this to preview in viewer pane, which I believe is the default option, you can see that now we see our output in this bottom right corner. If you haven't moved around your panes, that bottom right pane, um, it's the exact same content, just a different place to find it or that it might appear. Um, and so thinking about the organization of this output, it's just as important for us to keep our code organized and to know how we're working through the code. And so we see the same kind of issues where headers aren't clearly marked or we might not be sure what's happening in each code chunk. Um, our Markdown has some really helpful tools to navigate through your code document. So if you click in this bottom left corner where we see this green C, if I click that, it lists all the chunks of code, um, but it's not really clear what's going on in each of them. So if I hit chunk nine, I wouldn't have known where I was going to until I got here, unless you memorize the exact orders and numbers of your code chunks. Um, but we can make it easier to move around and to know what we're doing in each code chunk by adding um, chunk names. And so credit to, I forgot to give credit at the start of this, credit to Yihui Shi and Mine, who gave a presentation on this uh, last year. That's Mine setting Kaya Rundell. Um, but I mentioned Yihui here because there's a really helpful website that lists all of the different chunk options you can apply in R Markdown, and I'll provide a link to that in a little bit. Um, and the different uh, syntaxes and preferences for naming chunks. And so following their advice, uh, I give my chunk names with dashes in between. Uh, you technically can name your chunks with spaces in between different words. Uh, but that can sometimes throw errors. So I prefer having dashes. So here in this first chunk, I'm going to go ahead right in between these curly brackets where we saw the R. I'm going to write that this is where I'm loading packages. So I'm going to go ahead and name that load packages. And now you can see in the same space where we have this green C, at the bottom of our like main working area of our studio. Now that chunk actually has a name. So I know that's the chunk where I'm loading in the packages. Um, you can go through and name any of the chunks here. So the next one, this is where we're cleaning the data. So maybe I'll call this clean data. And again, now we know that that's the name of that chunk. And so we can navigate between these two more easily knowing what we're going to and what we're looking for. And the same kind of thing applies with your headers that are in the actual text portion of an R Markdown file. So here is where we're providing the project description, which is probably an important thing to mark as a header, both visually and in the code file to navigate. So I'm going to go ahead and add two hash marks in front of project description. And now you can also see that that's a new place that we can navigate to in this little navigation menu. And maybe measurement should also get a header. I'm going to add two hash marks there. And it's important to always include spaces between your hash marks and your title. Um, that's what makes sure it will um, appear and work as intended. Um, yes. So let's try and knit this again and kind of see what changed after adding those headers. And feel free to ask any questions or let me know if I'm moving too fast at this point. OK, so it looks like that has switched to my viewer pane. So you can see it, it showed up on this right hand side now. Um, and if we scroll down, we now have real title headers for project description and measurement. Um, and the size of these can actually be changed by changing the number of hash marks that are in front of your header. So if I wanted one of them to be smaller, you actually make the header smaller by increasing the number of 
uh, hash marks. So I would add a third one, and then that indicates like a sub-level, subheader level three here. And you can see it's indented a bit from project description as well. Um, so if we went through and added that throughout the document, it would probably highlight results, make it a little bit easier to read there as well. Just gonna throw that in. You can also do it with uh, any of the titles you have for tables and figures. Maybe I want it to be a little bit smaller than the one for the results and measurement. You can go through like that. Um, naming our code chunks didn't do much in terms of the output document. Like we don't see those titles in our output. Um, but maybe we don't want to see the code at all. Maybe we want this output to uh, mainly reflect the actual text and figures and results that we're discussing um, based on the code that we ran. But if it's for an audience that doesn't need to see the code, um, there are ways to hide that. Again, working in these curly brackets at the top of a chunk, we can add what are called chunk options. And so the first one I'm going to add at this first chunk is echo equals false. Um, the second one I'm going to add, which I'm jumping ahead a little bit here in order to make this code run a little bit faster, but there's a chunk option called cache, and I'm going to set that to true. And with cache equals true, what that does is it essentially saves any of the information that you're loading into R in this code chunk. And so by saying cache equals true here, one thing that might be slowing down your code if it's running slowly is that we're reading in this full SPSS file or the SAV file. Um, and so every time you're knitting, R has to go through and read that data file in. But with cache equals true, it saves that and remembers that, um, which can really speed up your code if you have a big data file that you're loading in and if you're knitting multiple times in a row uh, and playing around with this formatting like we're doing right now. So I'm going to go ahead and add that cache uh, chunk option now to hopefully save a little bit of time later. And so here we have the output again on this right hand side. Yes, Janine, I love cash. <laughs> it really speeds things up. Um, and now at the top of our at the top of our output, we actually don't see this code anymore. Um, the code is usually shown in these gray shaded boxes. Um, we're still seeing some messages and warnings though coming from the packages that we're loading in at that step. Um, so echo equals false. What that's doing is it's telling our markdown to hide the code. So it's hiding that part of the output. Um, but then we can go ahead and add two more super helpful chunk options, which are message equals false and warning equals false. And so the, the difference between message and warning, messages and warnings, is a little bit big. I, in my mind at least, I know there's definitions of what each of them are. <laughs> I believe these that are coming from the packages are messages. But then I think we were getting some warnings down with our histograms. Yes, you can see that we got a warning that it removed 90 rows containing non-finite values. So warning equals false would be the part that addresses uh, something like this that's showing up in your output. Um, so moving ahead, just so we can knit and see this, what this produces with a couple more. Um, in the clean data part, we also want to hide the code chunk and its output. So if we want to hide the code chunk, that's echo equals false, same as above. Message equals false. Let's take a look at what the output of that code is. That's a different kind of output. Um, so let's go ahead and add message warning equals false. Let me check the chat also. Um, 
Oh, Margarita, that's a great question. So right now we are going through and doing it for every single chunk. In just a second, I'll get to how to add it globally, because that is really helpful if you do want to hide your code all throughout, um, which based on the instructions in this code document or in this R Markdown file, we do want to hide the code throughout. Um, so the last chunk option I want to cover is include equals false. And so message and warnings are for the other things that R is automatically kind of throwing out at you. Um, but include equals false uh, gets rid of the output that you are creating from R. So at the bottom of this chunk, we have this summary, which is producing this that I highlighted right here, just summarizing our different variables and counts. Um, but if we don't want to show that, we could add this include equals false. And so I'm going to knit this again. So echo is for hiding your code. Include is for hiding your output, um, if that makes sense and is helpful. <laughs> um, so the code part is anything like this that's showing up or um, anything here, gray sections of your HTML output. And then here is the uh, stuff that's being produced by your code, the output of the code. You know I'm using output kind of interchangeably here, but um, being your HTML file versus uh, your code output. So I'm going to hit knit with these different ones applied just to these two chunks, and then we'll go through global chunk options. And hopefully after setting that cache, uh, that's running a little bit faster for you all. So now at the top of our HTML, the first thing that we see is project description. So all of this code, all of the messages and warnings that were coming out of it, and then all of this code and the output from this summary, um, that's all now being hidden which makes this a little bit easier to read, at least up to this point. Um, along with the headers, we've got headers here, headers here. So that makes it a little bit more readable, easier to work through, hopefully. Um, and so now I'm going to pull up, I'm going to pull up some reference code that I have because I have a lot of trouble remembering how to set global chunk options. <laughs> there are pretty specific numbers that are recommended for figure widths and things that I'll explain in just a second. Um, but I'm going to copy this over and I will put this in the chat as well. Hopefully that copies over all right. So global chunk options are something that I usually always set at the top of a R Markdown file uh, because they apply to all of your code chunks below that. And so here in the global chunk options, we're using the knitter package, which um, is my namesake, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Always funny to me. Um, and then we're setting, we're calling the options chunk and we're setting them. So here we have echo equals false. So this is the same one we were working with uh, down in these individual code chunks. And so I'll add the note just to explain, or just to have this in the final completed version for you all, that echo equals false. Uh, the purpose of it is to hide, um, hide your code. And then for message, this is to hide messages, like from packages loading in. Um, we were also seeing some messages. Yeah, you'll get them from other kinds of tables and figure things a lot. This bin with one with histograms. That's a really common message that I run into. Um, it's for the bin with message. Uh, and then for warnings, warnings. These are any of the kind of things that are 
maybe deems more important or worth some attention. Um, but we don't need to worry about them if we know that our code is doing what we need it to. So we set those as chunk options. Um, now moving ahead, there are ways to format how your tables and figures look in a really standardized way that can often make your output look a little bit cleaner. And so for now, I'm gonna pop this out into a new window. And we can see here that the, uh, the size of these figures is not necessarily standardized. Like this one is a lot larger than the individual plots here. Um, they're not all the same width or the same height. And so maybe that's something we're interested in making more regular. Can you see that? Um, sorry, okay. So big retina, the purpose of this as an option is that it's a ratio, it sets the granularity. Um, if you're making an output that's gonna be seen really big, maybe you wanna set this retina to be higher. Um, to be clearer and easier to see in a larger scale. Out width is scaling our plots to our output. So out width 70% is telling it that as we're scrolling through here, the figures are gonna take up 70% of the space that our text takes up in that output. The width is setting uh, actual standard width for your figures. Um, and then aspect ratio is a ratio of height to width, I believe. This aspect ratio is using the golden ratio or something. These are numbers that uh, I've seen recommended and they usually turn out pretty nice. Um, the one note I will give is that the global chunk options that you set here don't apply to the actual chunk where you're setting the options. And so if you don't want any of your code to show, the only place where you need to have a chunk option in this first uh, inside the curly brackets is in this first chunk. And then after this, we could delete this echo message warning uh, and they'll still be hidden. I'm going to keep include equals false for the clean data chunk. Uh, because include is not one of the chunk options that we had in our global options when we set it here. If you set the global option of include equals false as well, uh, the only thing we would have left in this HTML is that text that you have in between the code and the outputs. So that's not one that we want to set globally in this case. But I will go ahead and delete message warning echo since we have all of those set up here in the global options. I'll keep cache as well though, just for this chunk. And go ahead and hit knit. Um. Okay, so what does it look like now? I'm gonna pop it out into another window again just so we can see the full picture of the output. We are not seeing any code throughout here. As we're scrolling through, no code, no warnings, uh, just our text, our tables, our figures. So this is something that you could send to a boss or send to a team member who isn't familiar with code, doesn't care about your code, <laughs> is mainly interested in seeing the results of your research and the work you've done. A lot more reader friendly in that way. So great. Um, any questions on chunk options, global chunk options? And thank you, Janine and Mary, for helping me out in the chat. The next thing that we'll then move to um, another way to set global chunk options to view code if desired 
yeah, if you want to see your code all throughout and you just don't want the messages and warnings, you can get rid of this echo part. You can set up the global chunk options, however fits your needs in what you're trying to produce. So maybe we just didn't want to see the extra information that R was providing us from our code. Uh, but something like this, you would see just your code, figures, and text instead of any of the messages and warnings. Oh, to choose to view or not. Um, I'm actually not sure. I don't know if Janine or Mary have any experience with that. That's a great idea <laughs> to have it kind of collapsible in that way. I'm not familiar with that. I'd be interested if you do find anything like it. Um, okay, so moving right along, we added some headers, we cleaned up our file, and now going through what some of the actual text content is. Um, oh, good to know, JD. Thank you. So going through some of the actual text content and how we can make this easier to work with outside of our studio. Uh, I have this chunk with instructions to embed links to download files in our HTML output. So if we're providing someone with just an HTML output file, but in case they're interested, we want to provide them with the actual data file and the code book, and maybe even this R Markdown code file itself. Uh, it can be really nice to be able to embed that in the HTML where they can access it if they're interested in it. So for this, I might have missed this in the list of things to install. Um, so just in case, if everyone wants to install the XFun package as well, we'll only be using it to write out this chunk. So no worries if you're missing it right now. Um, feel free to just watch or follow along. Um, so with the XFun package, something we can do is embed files. And so the function for that is, I'm just going to call the XFun package here because I don't want to load it at the top of my R Markdown file because I only need it for this one thing. But the code is embed files. Uh, Rachel, I believe it can work in Word. I've run into some issues where Word throws, uh, we'll look at Word documents in just a little bit. Uh, I know it does work in slides, which we will also look at uh, later in this workshop. So if you only have one file that you're interested in embedding, you can just use embed file. Uh, I usually would embed multiple files in this case. So I'm going to pull embed files. And then we're going to give a list of file names. And this is one of the reasons that project files are super helpful. Because when I'm looking in my files that are here, which include a lot of different caches and outputs and things of what's to come in the presentation, um, you can actually use a fun shortcut that, I don't know if everyone knows this already, but if you type out these quotation marks, the double quotes inside wherever you're trying to call a specific file name, and then I'm gonna hit control space. I believe it's command space on a Mac. If I type out control space, it gives me a list of all of the files that are in my current uh, folder where my project file is. And so looking through here, if you have your zip file or if you use the zip file and have everything in the same location, what we're, you should be able to pretty easily find the data file, which is here, this.sav. And then I'm just going to keep using that shortcut because sometimes I know these file names, I think one of them coming up, <laughs> the Pew Research Center survey has this extra space before the docx and that's something that i would normally miss if i were trying to copy this by hand 
So I find that to be very helpful. So that docx file is the code book for the data that we're using in this uh, project. And so we've pulled the data file, we've pulled the code book, and now let's find this code file, which should be so many versions, should be this one. And then the next thing that we can do inside of this function is we can tell it what to print as text where you click for the link. So it's essentially like the text of the hyperlink that you would click on. Maybe we want it to say, click here for data, code book, and code file. And so, uh, let's also make sure to add a chunk name. I'm going to call this embed files. Uh, and I already have chunk option set where this should be good. So let's go ahead and knit and see what that looks like. Oh, that's really good to know, Janine, hiding the code with that. Great tip. Okay, so now we can see that we have the data and code book along with this code file can be downloaded at the link below. And here we see there is a hyperlink that says the text that we told it to say. Um, and if I click here, I will download a zip file that I can save into anywhere in my downloads. And so that's a really nice way to share what you did and then provide other information or context uh, that might be necessary or helpful. So another tip there. Now looking through, what else is this missing? Maybe we want an easier way to navigate our output, kind of like we can navigate our code chunks here moving around. Um, and so maybe we want there to be a table of contents inside of our HTML output. And so for this, we're going to move up into, Wendy, the keyboard shortcut was control space, or on a Mac, I believe it's command space. Um, course. So if we want to add a table of contents to our HTML, output, we can do that up between these triple dash dashes up here uh, in the area called the YAML. Um, and so I'm going to put a space or put hit enter before HTML document. Um, and I'm going to start setting some options for the HTML document. And so you can do that by adding another colon after it. Now, this, you have to make sure you're including the correct number of tabs. So you want HTML document to be one tab in from output, and then you want this next information to be one tab in from HTML document. So I'm going to type TOC with another colon, and I'm going to say true. I'm also going to add a little reference underscore, yes. <laughs> I'm also going to add TSC underscore float. Um, excuse me, yes is the correct way to use those. So TSC yes and TSC float, yes. Um, happy to copy that code into the chat if that's helpful. Um, let's see what that table of contents looks like. Does TOC float have to be further indented? I don't believe so. Um, at least not in how I've done it previously. I might be wrong on this. 
Uh, but let's see if it floats, and it looks like it does. Um, so if you didn't have TOC float there, um, what you would see is the table of contents would hang out at the top of this document. But now as we're scrolling through, the table, table of contents moves with us. Um, and one of the helpful things you can see is that any of the things that you set as headers or subheaders throughout your document now can be used to navigate to them from the table of contents. And so that would be more helpful if I had gone through and added them throughout the whole document. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll provide that full uh, subheadered version uh, in a bit. So what is next? Next, let's think about other ways that we could personalize what this output looks like. When we're looking at it uh, just in Chrome or in your browser, uh, maybe it looks a little bit plain or it looks just like all of the other outputs you would produce. And so if you want to make it a little bit prettier, nicer to read, you can set themes uh, for what the HTML output looks like. And so there is a way to do this by typing in the YAML. I personally like navigating from going back to this gear where we found the different preview methods. I'm going to go down to output options. And there are other things you can set here. You can set some of the same figure size customization that we did in the global options. Um, but for now, let's stick on the general tab and also set different levels for table of contents. There are a lot of ways to um, not have to write out the same code that you might do, the same things with, uh, but working from this menu. So let's try to apply a theme. Maybe Space Lab sounds like a fun theme. So I'm going to go ahead and set the theme to Space Lab. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, yeah, I should try the code folding to show it. Thank you. Let's do that. Do that on the next round, I guess. All right, so this is our theme, Space Lab. Uh, it doesn't look too different, it has a different font. Um, maybe it just looks nicer, we like it better. Um, just a way to kind of personalize and set the appearance using themes in that way. Yes. Great, let me try running with the code folding as well and see what that does. I probably need to remove the echo. If you go up to the top, there's a little button. Oh, thank you. Will it work with the echo as well? Oh, thank you. Perfect. If I hit show all code. Yeah, it looks like you might need to have echo is true. Um, which makes sense because it seems like Echo is just overriding the hiding of code. Yes. Okay. Um, great to know, though. Um, okay. A couple other just like little things I'll throw in while that's running. Um, as you're going through, if you're writing out a lot of information in your R Markdown file, uh maybe it's helpful to use a spell checker if you didn't know our markdown has or our studio has a spell checker built in you can go through and just make sure that everything you're spelling is right you can find with all of those spellings through there and it'll check your comments as well as your uh text through the file 
Let's take a look at the code. Awesome, that is a great feature, great tip. Thank you. Um, okay. So we can use our spell checker, we added a table of contents, we added themes. Um, now maybe we want to do a little bit more formatting on the actual text itself. Um, I have a very hard time remembering exactly what you need to do to get something to bold or underline. And bolding is actually pretty easy. But one thing that is really helpful is that there is a markdown quick reference you can access here from the help menu. So I usually pull this up whenever I need to do text formatting if I'm working um, in this version, the source file of the R Markdown file. So maybe I want to bold. Let's go back up to our research question. That would probably be a good thing to bold and format. Um, so here's our research question. Do perceptions about the quality of life vary by country? Maybe we want that to be bold. Uh, again, following the quick reference here. Also has really helpful information about headers, lists, which we will get to in a second as well. Uh, because I want to introduce the visual editor, which is a relatively new, I believe, feature of our markdown. Um, and it's a way that can make it easier to add all of this formatting uh, throughout your files, uh, and especially in modifying text rather than code. So to get to the visual editor, you can click this button right next to the source button to navigate over to visual. If it's your first time using visual editor, I believe you might get some messages just about using it. Um, feel free to click OK or next. So now we can see that this looks just a little bit different. Um, where we would normally have the code chunks uh, with the little three ticks, back ticks here, uh, we don't see those anymore. And looking through, we can actually see our headers as headers, which can be helpful if you forgot what level the header is or uh, just make it easier to see what it would look like without having to fully knit your document. And maybe I want to change what level header it is. Uh, you can actually do that from here as well. You can set the text to normal or any level of header. This would be the same as adding the hash marks in the standard source editor. Um, but it's a nice visual way to see, like, that's what a header 5 looks like. Uh, that looks pretty small to me. I probably wouldn't want a title to be a header 5. So I'm going to bring that back to a header two. And now, maybe I also want to bold this. And you can see that the way that the visual editor is set up is pretty close to a Word document and what you would see here. Um, makes it a lot easier to edit text. So now we can bold just by clicking that button. Same with italicizing. Maybe I want to underline something. Um, I don't see underlining here in the Markdown Quick Reference. So maybe I think it's easier to go into the visual editor, set the format to underline, and have that there. Other things you can do is it makes it a lot easier to do anything you would do in Microsoft Word or any other kind of word processing. Um, site. So hyperlinks are also easier to do instead of writing code for them. So maybe we want to add a hyperlink to the Pew website instead of having just the link here. So I'm going to select this, copy this link over. Maybe I want to hyperlink it right over here where it says Pew website. I'll link that to that URL. And now it's right there. We can get rid of the cellular link. Um, so we've done that, hyperlinks. So 
download titles, looking through. Here we want to add a table of the questions and response options. So this is providing information about the different questions that were used in the data, so things you would get from the codebook. And maybe in our report, we want to list these out in a table format that would be easier to read than a uh, just listing them like this in one big paragraph. So if I want to add a table of the question and response options, you can click on table right here and just insert a table. Uh, I don't know how many rows and columns it has, but you can add a caption header to it. So it's the table of questions and response options. And now we could call this the question and the response, and then maybe having the units in the next column. Um, and if we go back to the source to see what that would look like if you were doing it more manually in your standard R Markdown file, scrolling down, this is how that table gets formatted, which once you start adding a bunch of text into it and filling it out, uh, can feel kind of messy to be <laughs> editing it in that way. Um, I'll often go to the visual editor if I'm working with any of these text type things and it a lot easier to work through. Same with bulleted lists, which I will scroll down. Um, here to the characteristics of the sample by country. Maybe I also want this to be a header. And I'm interested in making a bulleted list. It can be nice to do that visually as well. So first level bullet point, second level bullet point, same as you would in a standard word processor. Any questions so far? I don't know if people have used Visual Editor much, but um, I think it's a really nice tool to have. And so the last thing in Visual Editor is adding citations. So here in our discussion section where we're summarizing things, maybe we want to cite some literature. And so Visual Editor, again, just makes it very easy to add citations. And so I'm going to add a citation here. And I have these pulled up already, just for my reference. Open the Markdown Quick Preview. Um, the Markdown Quick Reference, if that's what you're asking about, it's up at Help, and then Markdown Quick Reference, accessed from the Help section. I will always keep this open if I'm not working in Visual Editor, but either one or the other um, can be very helpful. So I found this article or this journal article that I thought might be relevant to the <laughs> to the data being discussed in the uh, the project, which I know we haven't really talked about the data <laughs> at all, but um, maybe I think it's relevant and I want to cite this when I'm discussing. And so what I can do is in this case, I'm going to pull the PMID. And here, where I wanted to add the reference, I'm going to go to Insert, and then Insert Citation. And so you can search for my citation from a set that you might already have in a, a set of sources from a different R project. Um, but you can also, really helpfully, uh, search by DOI, search Crossref, uh, and I'm going to go to PubMed with that PubMed ID that I took from the website. And here's my study. I'm going to put that PubMed ID in the chat in case you want to try it out yourself. And I am just going to hit, I believe it's already been added here. You can see at Campos 2014 has been added. 
And if I hit insert, now I have inserted this citation right here into my discussion. So I'm going to add one more, and maybe this one. I have a DOI instead of a PubMed ID. So let me pull this from here. And then again, go to insert citation. And now I'll search by a DOI. And there it is. Welcome to the Tidyverse. Um, I add it and insert it. That's right here. And so when you're working with citations in this way, um, R for citations over Zotero. I am actually not super familiar with the methods R uses to format citations. I will say it can be really helpful when you're producing like final reports. If you want to be able to go straight from your R Markdown code file into a report that you can hand over that has all of your references, it has all of the information you're trying to include at one time. Um, when I'm writing some academic papers, I still do <laughs> just use Zotero or Mendeley. I'm not writing all of my academic papers in R, but this just kind of proves that you really could. <laughs> Um, and now we see that a bibliography, references.bib, has been added um, up at the top in our YAML here. Oh, it did. Uh, JD said Zotero library showed up in RStudio in that insert citation dialog box. That's awesome. I need to start using Zotero <laughs> instead of Mendeley. That is extremely helpful. Uh, so just another way that you can integrate those together. Um, and so what R does is it creates this .bib file that houses your references. And so one of the slightly challenging things about doing this is you just need to make sure that that .bib file is um, transported uh, with your R Markdown file if you want other people to be able to knit it with references. And so if you want that, you can go back down to embed files <laughs> and you can add that as one of the files you want to embed. Um, which I guess hasn't been created yet because I haven't knit this yet, but there I would type in references.bib. Maybe I'll just add that after I have run this once. Um, no reason to go back to your source versus visual. You can knit from visual as well. That was just a little habit showing. So let's see how our references show up and all of the other formatting that we added. Uh, the tables and the bolding, underlining, great, that's all in here, just how it looked in the visual editor. Um, I didn't add anything into this table that we made here, but you can see the caption is listed as kind of a title to the table. Um, and then anything you had inside that table would obviously populate there. Now we have a references section. Um, it has the citations for both of the articles that we cited above uh, listed right here, formatted pretty nicely. It looks about right to me for uh, just a generic reference formatting. So I haven't played around too much with different formatting styles, but I think Janine said something in the chat about how to set those. Um, definitely something you can change and work on. Okay. So from here, does anyone have any questions on visual editor, chunk options, other R Markdown formatting with an HTML output? Otherwise, we're going to move over to Word outputs if there are no questions. Embed files don't work. Um, hmm. 
I would make sure that all of your files references didn't show. Okay. Um, not sure. Zip warning. Yeah, Robin, that's definitely possible. I know X Fun is not doesn't always work seamlessly. <laughs> I have run into several um, issues with it, just in terms of making sure your files are all in the right place, they have the right name. Um, when I was teaching this class to students, I know that they had some issues just with how files were set up. But um, yes, XFun is funky. Um, it's helpful when it works. I am not an expert in troubleshooting it. Um, so I apologize for that. But miss anything else? And about references not showing, um, I would check that you have the references.bib up here and that after you have knit, it should appear in your um, files. So make sure that you see a references.bib in your files here. And I can't think of any other reasons why it might not be showing, but it could help. Oh, yes. And make sure you knit it. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm just going to keep moving. I was thinking about a break, but unless people really want a break, I know um, the next two parts should go pretty quickly. Janine, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, people can put in the chat if they like a break or no break. Maybe. I don't have a preference. Okay. Um, great. Yeah, let's keep moving. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yes, because we'll just be working from the same file, going through um, knitting to Word, and then creating slides. So both of those should be pretty quick. I've got them prepared for you. Uh, so if you go to the file 02 underscore Word, um this has everything that we did already applied throughout the chunk options um things will be different this was made not right now <laughs> um i have some extra notes here if you're curious about reading them but let's get that file opened up um, and scanning through, yes, we've got our references in here. We've got the table that we made, bulleted list, all of these different things. Um, and so for right now, because I didn't share this word style ref and because it's nice to learn how to build one on your own, uh, let's delete this line about having a reference doc. And then I'm going to just hit knit. So the idea with a style reference document is it's essentially a Word document that you create where you have set up how you want a, a Word document knitted file uh, to look, how you want it to be formatted. And so it's something that is really helpful. Okay, so this is what I get when I have the, well, excuse me, I'm showing other files right now. <laughs> Let me stop screen sharing for just one second. But that warning that you saw um, about the document containing fields that refer to other files, I got that warning when I tried to knit to Word when I had the XFun embedded. So I'm going to try to just go ahead and hit um, yes to update the fields in this document. And then, sorry for that, I have always have other windows open. <laughs> um, I will start screen sharing again in just a second. Okay. So here is our Word document that came out. Um, I hit yes to downloading below, or downloading um, being connected to other files. I don't think that actually did anything. Um, 
it looks the same as it did before. So I'm honestly not sure what that warning is, but to move along, um, this is how the formatting looks for right now. This is how it has automatically, yes, not sure X fun works with Word. I thought it might with the other error message selection, but no. Um, okay, so creating a style reference. When we're thinking about a style reference, we're thinking about how we would want this to export. And so making a style reference takes some amount of work up front, um, but it then standardizes and gives a good standard format that your uh, documents will be exported to Word as in the future. Can I be knitted once? So you can edit them in our markdown. That's definitely something you can do. And setting the style of reference is a part of making sure that what you're producing looks how you want it to produce and that any formatting progress you've made uh, gets saved, essentially. So I'm going to go here. So I have the title My Research Project, and it's in this bold blue text. Um, but maybe I don't want it to look like that. So here, there's a styles menu, usually under home. I think it has moved around recently. You might find it under design, but under home, here is styles. And I'm going to pop this out into this other window. So it's telling me that what I have selected right now is a title, but maybe I want to change how Word formats titles. So I'm going to modify this. If I modify the style, maybe I'm fine with it being in Calibri, but maybe I want it to be red and underlined or anything else that you're interested in setting there. And so in my table of contents, this style formatting is really nice because it just pops up wherever you are. So, sorry to clarify, as I'm hovering over project description, it's telling me that this is a heading too. So it'll automatically tell you what you're looking at and what format you would need to change in order to change what it looks like. So project description is a heading too. Maybe I want heading twos to be purple text and italicized. I'm picking these to make it really pop when we see what, the <laughs> what it looks like uh, after the style ref has been set, just to make sure we see it. Um, and now maybe I don't like this font that it's using. And so for first paragraph, Instead of Cambria, let's set it to Calibri 12. Um, and so that didn't apply to these body text pieces or compact or whatever other parts these are in, but um, maybe I'll set the body text as well to Calibri. And so now this is a formatted document, um, but in order to have these formatting style choices applied to future Word documents, uh, let's go ahead and save this. I'm going to save it in the same folder that we've been working in. Um, and I'm just going to save it as workshop style ref. And that's fine. All right, and now let's move over back to our studio. And let's put back that um, style reference line. So we had our reference underscore doc X, and I called it the workshop style ref, I believe. Yes. Um, and so let's just try knitting this again and see what happens.
Feel free to ask any questions while we wait for this to run. Hmm. Um, I believe that might be because I have the file open. Let me see if that solves my issue. As you all know, errors happen. <laughs> Error messages and warnings happen all the time. And it's just got to try to figure out what it's telling you. There we go. And again, showing you other files. Um, all right. So this looks like it's using the style that we set before. Uh, we've got our, our subheading twos in that purple color. Our title is red and underlined. Um, and it looks like everything we wanted to be in the other font is in that font. And so that's kind of the process of setting a style ref. And so it is really an iterative process. It isn't super easy to go through and change. Imagine changing um, every single possible style thing here in this list of a Word document. Um, but there are ones that you might be using more often than others. So obviously body text and heading twos I used a lot of. So I made some kind of step of progress uh, in terms of setting up a style reference that I was looking for. And that could be used for um, future exports. Okay, any questions on knitting to Word? All right. So let's move along to slides, if there are no questions. How to create the reference doc? Yeah. Um, so that is what we were doing when we knit one version of this file. And so by having one knitted version, we kind of are able to see and use the different heading levels and styles that Word has uh, for these different pieces here. And so we were able to set uh, a first paragraph, whatever that means, um, and a heading to. And you can set those styles and then just save that um, version of your knitted Word file um, as a reference doc. And so I saved it in the same folder. I saved it as workshop style ref. And then you can call that so that the next thing you export has the same format. Hope that answers the question. Great. All right. So the last thing that we'll quickly touch on is how to make slides from an R Markdown document. And so feel free to pull up the R Markdown file 03 underscore slides that was in the GitHub. This one, like the Word one, already has our completed work of formatting this document in it. Um, it also has some other additions, which I will explain in just a second. I'll give you all a sec to pull it up. Oh, and for this, we will be using the package Zeringen, which I don't think we asked you to install either. Um, I just put the name of it in the chat. Feel free to install that here. Uh, it doesn't get in, it doesn't get added into like the packages we're loading or anything. It's changing what we're doing up here in the YAML. We're calling Zeringen. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Also, um, <laughs> has any thoughts on how that's pronounced? But... <laughs> Thanks, yeah. All right. And so the settings we have up in this YAML, I actually pulled from 
um, another person. And I actually don't make slides out of R Markdown that often, but I do think it's really helpful to be able to do it, um, especially if you're giving a presentation out of content like this, where you are working from uh, data and things you ran in R. This is the part where copying and pasting errors can really get solved or eliminated if you're pulling everything from the same document. Um, the same place where you're running your analysis is where you're uh, making your slides. And so we can go ahead and just try to knit this right away. Um, or just to talk through what this is doing, it's telling it to add a slide number. Um, Moon Reader and Nature, I think, are pretty standard things that you call in the YAML here. Uh, highlighted style, I'm setting some style features that aren't very prominent. I haven't, um, I don't have a real theme applied to this slide output. Ratio is the size of the slides, and then counting the incremental slides. Um, the main thing that has changed from our other R Markdown files is that we've added some of these dash marks here. So I'm going to go ahead and knit this so we can see what they look like exactly, um, or what happens based on them. But these three dash marks are indicating um, a new slide starting. And then the two dashes are indicating a um, kind of like an animation or something where you want more text to appear after you've, when you click to go ahead. So more text appearing on the same slide. This one I'm going to pull out into the full window for sure. It might take just a second. Um, while this is loading, basically I, I didn't change any of the code really, just added in those different slide breaks. And so there are other things you can do to play with the formatting after you see how it looks. Um, like if your figures aren't fitting correctly, you can play with that figure width or the aspect ratio of your figures. You can do that in individual chunk option areas. Um, instead of having the global chunk options or whatever to make it fit better in the actual presentation format. So here, title slide is exactly what we have in the YAML, the title of the presentation, and now it's a presentation, the title of the R Markdown file and the author. Now we can see our headers are here and our text is here. Um, it doesn't seem to like underline although that is how it would appear in um, the R Markdown source as well. You can see that's how underline gets formatted. Um, if you do it from Visual Editor, I'm not sure why it doesn't want to cooperate on that one. And now we can see this is exactly where we had our two dash marks um, between these different lines. And so I'm hitting right arrow to move ahead, and these extra lines are appearing based on where I put those double dashes. And then all of these separate individual slides are where I have triple dash marks uh, throughout the R Markdown document. And yeah, it's that easy. <laughs> um, I will say some of the figures, like this one, is clearly... Whoop, there go. This one is clearly not formatted as it should be. You can see that there are more plots that are not showing here. Um, and so that's something that I would definitely play around with how the ggplot is outputting and then also changing the chunk options to see if there's anything you can mess with to make that fit a little bit better on the slides. But otherwise, it is 
all right here, except for the references. Um, and I did a little bit of research and found that there's a different package that can be used to add references if you're using Zeringen for slides. Um, and I'll pop this link in the chat in case anyone is really interested in this, but it's obviously also in the um, R Markdown files. Um, I think that is about it. The other thing I will mention is there's a whole other package for all of the lovely custom theming you can do with Zeringen slides. Um, I have not worked with this too much, but it can really look just as pretty as a PowerPoint or as Google Slides. Um, so I highly recommend looking through if you're interested in doing that. And I think that is all I have for you today. But if anyone has any questions, closing thoughts, <laughs> let me know. Rashford, yes, dot our proj files. Um, I, I've been searching for a good way to explain how they work exactly for about a year now. <laughs> but I, I think the main way they make your life easier is it's a file that you put in the same folder where all of your other files are, but it has more of a memory um where it remembers what files you had open in this project and it knows what files are in this folder and involved in this project and so right now i'm working out of this project file that i made for this presentation and so it automatically sets my directory as this folder where the r project file is and it knows exactly where i'm working from it helps with the um finding the files like we did here with XFun and embed files. Um, what else does it do? I really like that it remembers. So if I'm working on multiple different things and I close out one project, I can open another one and not have to deal with the same files being open, the same things in my memory or in my environment here. Um, but Janine, if you have a better explanation of what it does. Um. Mostly, I, I think one of the things it does is it sort of sets your working directory within that folder that you're in so that all the like links to data and links to other file that's are in your R markdown, those are all um, with respect to that working directory where your project file is instead of mm -hmm. having to type out the whole uh, like location of a folder like C colon slash slash yeah. and all that. And, the, and one reason that's great is because if you're collaborating with somebody else, their file paths on their laptop is going to be different from the file paths on your laptop. But if you've put a project file in there, it makes it consistent for anybody who's opened that project through that file. So that's, that's kind of what I, what I use it for. Yeah, it's really great for collaborating too. I miss that part. Yeah. Um, our Markdown and our Notebook. I actually haven't worked in our Notebook at all. I have heard it's <laughs> a thing you can do. Um, I work pretty exclusively in our Markdown, but there's no real reason for it. So um, I'd be interested to hear if anyone prefers our Notebook or what it's for even. Yeah, I, I think they're similar. I've never used Notebook either. And now I just looked it up and it says, um, <laughs> Notebook is a way to work with Markdown files. So <laughs> I think they might... don't have their own file format. They all use RMD, which is what we're working in tonight. So I think there's probably not much of a difference. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I, I guess if people were used to using like Jupyter notebooks for their work, maybe the word notebook would be more uh, familiar and that would be make it an easier transition. Who knows? 
Well, I think I'm going to stop our recording.